Hey everyone, welcome to the Canine Culture Podcast, where we talk about everything dog. Q and A's with veterinarian professionals, rescue operators, everyday topics. We cover everything dog on this podcast. So make sure you subscribe to the Canine Culture Podcast on your favorite podcast platform, and make sure you're following us on social media on both Instagram and Facebook. Thanks again for listening. Now here's that next episode. Today we have a special guest and her name is Nicole Bertolini and she is a vet in Texas. So welcome to the show, Nicole. Thanks. Happy to be here. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. So, um, Born and raised in Houston, Texas, went to Texas A&M for undergrad and for veterinary school. Absolutely love being an Aggie. And after veterinary school, I pretty much came straight back to the Houston area. And I've done a little bit of of everything. Like I've done, um, I graduated in 2018 from veterinary school. So I've done two years of general practice, like primary care. I did a year of learning some of the advanced surgeries um, and a, at a different practice. And now I'm doing exclusively ER medicine in Katy, Texas. Okay. So whenever you became a vet, so you graduated 2018. And for anyone that doesn't know, including myself, because I feel like it, the vet practice, the way you become a vet is a little bit different. Do you guys have to go through like a residency or have to have like a certain number of like residency hours? Gotcha. So veterinary medicine is really cool in that aspect. Technically, you don't have to do a residency to come out and practice. Uh, A lot of it is more so you can come out and you can straight ahead do like primary care. And then from there, you can kind of learn what you like, what you don't like. If you're someone who likes surgery, you can go to a bunch of continuing education courses. You can kind of advance your career in that aspect without having to be board certified. But now the things are changing a little bit. Veterinary medicine is becoming very much like human medicine where there are specialties. And so it's almost like when you go to your family practitioner, but you need some sort of surgery or to see a dermatologist, they refer you. So GP work is kind of a little bit of everything. And then if you need a more specific field or something like a surgery or something, you can send them there to be a board certified dermatologist, cardiologist, um, you know, internal medicine specialist, surgeon to be Mm -hmm. board certified. You do have to do like a residency program and then sit for your boards. So kind of like a yes and a no, like I'm not going to go do hip replacements in dogs, but I have done some orthopedic surgeries in dogs, or I've done some advanced soft tissue surgeries in dogs. And as long as you do no harm, you're okay. So it's really just kind of about what you're interested in. And some people absolutely hate surgery. Some people hate internal med. Some people just want to do, you know, they want to be really good at exotics and you can do all that if you have the interest for it. I didn't know that you could be a dermatologist for animals. And now I'm rethinking my whole life because (laughs) (laughs) if I could avoid poking them with needles and cutting and just identify skin issues and then have my vet tech do everything else, that really could have been the setup. So when I grow up, that's what I want to be. That sounds great. And and it's true. It's true. You can just um, some people like when you get out of school, like I said, some people, when they're in school, they want to go straight into a residency, which you can do. So if you're in your fourth year of veterinary school, which is like your clinical year, and you're like, I want to be an internal medicine doctor, and that's all I want to do. Well, you can apply to go do your residency at another school immediately, right away. And it's usually about another three or four years. And then you come out board certified. Or you can kind of do the route that I've done, where I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do coming out of school. I kind of liked everything. And so I did general practice, learned what I like, what I don't like. And then now I'm kind of like narrowing myself more into the field that keeps me excited every day. So I do really enjoy surgeries. I like soft tissue more than orthopedic surgeries. Um, And now that I'm doing primarily just ER medicine, 
I love it. And I get to do those soft tissue surgeries and I get to do, um, you know, life-saving things or work with um, like critical patients. And so far, I think I've like settled now to where I probably will do ER like the rest of my life um, type okay. of situation. Yeah. Yeah. So your current practice is ER medicine. So do you work, is it a hospital or is it just a vet clinic that has like a emergency department? It is a hospital. So I work for veg, which is veterinary emergency group. They're all they, all we do is emergency and critical care. So, and we're open 24 seven. So if there is a, a veterinarian who needs help, like they can't see a patient, they can send them straight to us. We're open overnight. We take in any sick animal um, and hospitalize them. So it's all we do. It's what our specialty is. And so there are a lot of veterinary practices, though, that are daytime emergencies. So they'll take walk-ins, whereas there's other practices that are only appointment only. So if they can't get in with their appointment only doctors or they can't see them quick enough for a walk-in appointment, then they can come to us and they'll be seen right away. Okay. So emergency medicine, it's probably like the emergency room for humans and you see literally everything. Yeah. Yes. And including coding patients um, and dogs that are bleeding, dogs that need emergency attention. And, you know, I think a lot of the things that we see are very similar to some daytime practice stuff. Like my dog's been vomiting, you know, my dog's been having diarrhea or like my dog mm -hmm. can't pee, which obviously we're going to kind of circle back to soon. But, uh, but we also have the specific equipment that a lot of daytime emergencies don't have because all we do is emergency. So we might have specific surgical tools or like an oxygen chamber for patients that are having issues breathing. So we're a little bit advanced in that aspect, but um, yeah, it's, and the cool thing about veterinary emergency group is you actually get to stay with your pet the whole time. So oh, if that's you awesome. Your, yeah. You bring your dog in and instead of, you know, having to drop them off at the door when you're having a panic because something's going off your dog, you stay with your dog the whole time. The veterinarian comes immediately over to you. We say hi to you. We triage your, you and your pet and go straight from there. But you can watch them get x-rays done. You can watch them get their catheter placed and you can see everything else that's going on too. So you can see that we're doing a laceration repair over by the surgical suite, or you can see, you know, other clients and things. So we love it because it's transparent and with something like an emergency situation, you want to be there with your pet and we don't want to separate you. So it's been an awesome experience and I absolutely love working for them and I love ER medicine. So I'll probably with, be with them for the long haul. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So yeah. this whole episode, I want to dig into bladder stones, but before we do, because you are an ER vet, so to speak for anyone listening is there ever a scenario, and I know very much like when people ask attorneys a question and we're like, it depends because it always depends, but is there ever a scenario where you're like, hey, this doesn't need to come to the ER, like this can wait, like, do you see that frequently? And if so, what does that normally look like? Yeah, absolutely. So something else that we do, people can call, obviously can call ahead of time and mm -hmm. they'll talk to a doctor right away. So they'll call us and the doctor will answer. We'll be like, Hey, what, how's it going? What's going on? Um, and they'll be like, my dog just vomited like one time tonight. Like, should I bring it in? Or do you think it can wait for my general practice, you know, practitioner in the morning? Or, you know, they'll say, um, it ate a bunch of Reese's, like, should I bring it in? Or I think it did this, should I bring it in? And a lot of times what I say is, like, there's some things that are clearly emergency, you know, if you're like, my dog's not breathing right, I'm like, just head straight over here, like, let's see right. what's going on, even if it's nothing, like, we're gonna, you know, take a look at it. Um, but if it's like, well, he vomited once, but he seems okay, then I usually say, hey, you know, happy to see your pet, if you're concerned, we're concerned, but if he doesn't vomit again, then maybe it was just a one-time thing and maybe you can see your GP in the morning. Um, but if it happens again or a couple of times, you should probably bring him in. So we kind of just like help them with that, that thought process, you know, uh, okay. I think this is an emergency. Is it an emergency? And we kind of say, Hey, you should come in or, you know, that, that should be able to wait. Like if your dog ate a piece of a plant, that's not poisonous. Like they can probably wait and see how they right. do. So 
but yeah, absolutely. We get, we get calls um, all the time and we just, you know, but like I said, we always let people know if you're really concerned, just let's take a look at them. You know, we don't have to do anything other than have a physical exam and have a talk. And, and if you want to go home and watch them like, great, you know, but Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times, a lot of times, sometimes too, owners think that some one particular thing's going on, but it's actually something else. And we kind of figure that out with them. So, um, but yeah, so like you said, it depends, but we are there to help talk them through that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. I don't know if any clinics are like that in Jacksonville, we really don't have that many emergency clinics to be such a big city. And I feel like most of them either shut down. Some of them went corporate, not that there's anything wrong with that, but they have certain guidelines, certain things they're trying to do. Um, so anytime that I've ever called, it's always, well, I'm not a doctor. You can't talk to the doctor. Come on in. So that's really nice that you guys do that because that could have probably saved me thousands of dollars over my life. (laughs) Yes. And actually, so I have some good news for you. Veg is coming to Jacksonville. Oh, no way. Do you know when? Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, within, I think by 2023, like it's supposed to be built by the end of 2023. So within the next year or two, we actually have, um, we have two in Tampa. We're going to have one in Miami, Jacksonville, but yeah, so we like, we're definitely across the country. Uh, it started in New York and now we've kind of like spreading a little bit of everywhere. So you absolutely will have that, um, which is amazing. And actually if, if you really, if you don't like, if you want to talk to a doctor still, but you're in a different state, you can call any veg and they'll talk to you. So you don't have to um, be like, I, you know, I don't live there. Can I talk to you? And be like, no, sorry. If you were to call any veg and be like, I just need to talk to a doctor. We'll talk to you. It's not like, okay. You have to be, yeah. So if you ever have That's like awesome. a major concern, just give us a call, give any, any one of us a call and we can help try and guide you through that. Okay. Awesome. All right. So to get into the main subject matter, we are going to talk about bladder stones. And what's kind of crazy is today I'm in like 50 Pomeranian rescue groups on Facebook. And this one Pomeranian had a massive bladder stone removed. And I didn't read the full write up, uh, but I did see that. And the timing of it was kind of crazy. So what are bladder stones? Yes. And so bladder stones in dogs is very similar to like kidney or bladder stones in humans. So they're kind of like, um, they're a bunch of, of mineral or crystals essentially that are being formed because of different reasons. So maybe the pH of the urine is more acidic or more alkaline. Um, maybe something's going on with their diet. Maybe they already have a UTI. All of these things kind of come together and make like the perfect storm and a rock-like formation of those minerals form. Uh, It can be one large one, like one single large one. It can be multiple large ones, or it can even be ones that are almost as small as sand, like gravel. And really, uh, it can happen to, um, they they can have big ones and tiny gravel ones in there. A lot of the times though, the type of stone is dependent on the type of storm that was brewing. So, you know, what kind of crystals, what kind of urine, alkaline, are they some, like a pet that tends to harbor UTIs? Like what happened there um, for that to kind of, you know, come together and make a one, you know, a couple actual stones. Okay. So what issues can they cause? So it sounds like just based on your description, it sounds like they could cause your pet to not be able to go to the bathroom. Uh, which foreseeably could lead to a number of other issues, but what are the issues associated with the bladder stone? Absolutely. So the most common clinical sign that we see or owners bring their pets in for is there's blood in their urine. Uh, they're like going outside, going to the bathroom, and their dog has blood in their urine, um, you know, or maybe they keep going outside acting like they have to go pee and they can't pee or they're peeing really small amounts. And so sometimes they come in being like, I think my dog just has a UTI because it keeps trying to go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we're like, sure, we can do a urinalysis or we can, you know, see what's going on. And yes, there probably is a urinary tract infection, but then maybe we find crystals and then maybe we need to do some more investigating. 
Um, and the, it, the interesting thing too is that these stones can go undetected for a while. Sometimes we'll be taking x-rays of an animal for something completely different and incidentally find stones. So there's some dogs that have them and never had any clinical signs from them or not yet. And then there's other dogs that are starting to show those clinical signs. And so they're brought into the vet because of like difficulty or, or odd issues happening with urination. Are there any other symptoms to kind of be on the lookout for? Because like you said, it sounds a lot like a UTI. So is there any other, because I think a lot of people might just call their vet up and if they have a good relationship, they might just say, Hey, Rover has a UTI, call me in something and the vet might. And so I could see that causing harm. So are there any other symptoms? Yeah. So the, the biggest one for um, causing harm would be them going outside and repeatedly trying to urinate and nothing's coming out. So some dogs will sit there and posture and just posture and posture and nothing will come out. And then the owner will be like, huh, maybe it is UTI, but then they'll take them back out later and they're still posturing because they, there's a stone or something that's blocking their urethra. So that's kind of um, one of the things. The other thing is sometimes owners are like, I had no idea what was going on, but my dog started vomiting or it started uh, not wanting to eat or not uh, being like really lethargic. And the reason that is, is because if the stone is blocking for them from being able to urinate, it changes, you know, it makes their stomach painful, but it also the kidneys get really angry because they can't release urine that they're making. And so then they start feeling really ill. And so when that happens, owners are like, they're just kind of not themselves. And they come in and we do a physical exam and we feel a really large firm bladder. And we're like, we need to take some x-rays. Like we need to see what's going on. Yeah. So if you were to leave bladder stones untreated, like you said, sometimes they're there, nothing happens and you randomly catch them, but it, it, hypothetically, what could happen if you didn't treat the bladder stone or if you didn't catch it in time? I mean, unfortunately, I would think left long enough with a big enough stone and enough issues, maybe death. Um, but I mean, what are the what are the issues that could come up if you don't catch them? Yeah. So from the least um, life threatening, what we will see is return recurrent UTIs because these stones are like nidus of infection or they're just, even when you give them a, you, like you give them an antibiotic, they're great on the antibiotic a week after being off of it. They're having these bloody sign, urine signs again. So you can have these repeat UTIs, which causes uh, resistance. And then they can have, it can be harder and harder to treat them to, for their actual UTI, UTI because you've been treating them so long. Now they have like a resistant one and need like major medication. Um, the other thing is that when these stones are bouncing around in there, they're causing damage to the bladder wall. So it's kind of like in there, just causing damage and thickened in, um, bladder mucosa. And that can also harbor more bacteria or they can just be so painful that they um, keep showing the clinical signs. Um, the most life-threatening thing is if there is a bladder stone that is blocking the urethra and a dog, cat, whatever the case may be, and we don't catch it soon enough, yes, their bladder can absolutely rupture. And if that happens, it becomes an emergency surgery. So we have to go in, try and take the urine out of the abdomen, re, like fix that bladder that has ruptured and, um, and then keep them hospitalized to get them through it. If you catch a ruptured bladder soon enough, a lot of times you can get them through it. But if, it, if not, then it is usually, unfortunately, um, you know, very life-threatening. Like they usually don't come back from, from that. And what, what symptoms are associated with a, a ruptured bladder? W would you know immediately if that happened to your dog? I would say, you know, first you would see them not being able to urinate and you, you know, I know some people will let their dogs just outside, right? Like right. just open up the door, let them outside. Like, you know, you're not paying attention. Like, I mean, that's what we all do. Um, but it's when they stop eating, especially if you have like a Labrador that eats everything. It's when they mm -hmm. stop eating 
And then when they start vomiting, when they start becoming lethargic and not wanting to get up and move around, that is when those are like the, t the signs before it happens. Those are the kidneys getting angry. And, you know, um, let's say sometimes some owners will feel on their stomach and their stomach is painful. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, Ooh, something's going on. I should really get them checked out. And so usually it's when all of a sudden they're doing okay. And maybe having some urinary signs to being really ill that they're, um, that they bring them in. And then we, um, you know, do our diagnostics to kind of figure out what's going on and, and go from there. And let's say your dog's bladder, let's say it ruptures and maybe it happens at night and you're asleep and you wake up eight hours later. Are you still in a safe timeline or are we getting a little bit dangerous? Getting dangerous, definitely getting dangerous because, you know, that urine, the electrolytes, things are being very far thrown off. Um, doesn't mean that we haven't fixed one before though. So, okay. um, yes. So they have come in, their bladder ruptured, or maybe it was originally just a small leak. And now all of a sudden they're showing the clinical signs. So they have made it through it. Absolutely. Um, but the longer, of course, the worse, but I mean, you know, it can happen when you're at work, like you're at work all day, like I right. work 12 hour days, you know, so, yeah. um, it can happen. And so, yes, we can get them through it. Um, and, uh, just of course, like anything time is of the essence, but I would say when you're starting to get like over 12 hours to like 24 is when we're looking kind of more, um, surgery may not even help get them through it. And so okay. we just have a, yeah, have like a real talk about that. Yeah. And as far as the surgery goes, so for a bladder stone in and of itself, so actually let me back up for treatment of a bladder stone. Um, obviously you're going to do antibiotics, right? Okay. And then is there a, like a medicine or a drug to kind of like dissolve the bladder stones? Yeah. So, um, there's kind of three different ways for treating bladder stones or like, let's say, okay, so I'll run like a case scenario real quick. So a dog comes in, he's straining to posture, um, or a female, it can happen to female dogs too. Um, straining to urinate, nothing's coming out. You do an, an urinalysis, there's a UTI, there's some crystals, there's some blood in the urine. And then you're like, Hey, let's do some x-rays. And so we do some x-rays and we see a stone in the urethra, like in the actual urethra. And we're like, that's an issue. And you see the stones in the bladder. The first thing we actually do is we usually try and pass a urinary catheter and push that stone back into the bladder so that they can urinate and we like release their bladder. And so that they, you know, it doesn't rupture. Mm -hmm. Then from there, we talk about, okay, this is where we're at. We know that your dog has bladder stones and we know that he could easily block again. Like that's something that can happen. Um, do you, the best thing to do is go in and take them out. So do a bladder surgery and remove those stones. The next thing though, that's not, that's not available to everybody though. Like not everyone can do a surgery or wants to do a surgery on their pet. And so we talk about, you know, the benefits and, you know, risks for both things. But the other thing you can do is you start them on, of course, an antibiotic but then you can actually put them on some diets and there's some diets out there. It's like a urinary uh, prescription diet that if it's a certain type of stone, which is called a struvite stone, it can dissolve those. But you play that risk where we're like, we're not hundred percent sure what type of stone it is unless we take it out and send it in. Um, so we can try this urinary dissolution diet but it may not work. So usually I say you should go back to your primary care or come back to us in a month. Let's see if these stones are less, if they're like a little bit more dissolved, like see if we're making a difference. And if we're not, then we probably need to go take them out uh, because they're not going to go away. Okay. I think you just answered one of my questions too, was how do you know what kind of stone it is? But I guess you, I mean, you have to remove it in order to figure that out unless is there any kind of blood work that would maybe indicate like, hey, this dog has bladder stones and it's this kind? Yeah. Usually if we get lucky and the crystals show up in the urine, it can tell you or you can get a best estimate of what type of crystal. So is it calcium oxalate crystal? Is it struvite crystals? Is it, you know, urate crystals? And so then that can kind of help guide you. 
Um, and also sometimes the what they look like on x-ray can also give you an idea. Sometimes those big honking ones that look like rocks in there that are smooth, a lot of times those are struvite. Uh, and then sometimes some of those smaller ones that are in there tend to be calcium oxalate. And the calcium oxalate are the ones that we can't really dissolve. So um, that helps guide, but then I've had times where I'm like, oh, this is definitely you know, a calcium oxalate. And I go in right. there, you can take it out, you send it to the lab, the lab gets back to you in a week or so. And it's not, you know, or you're like, oh, okay, well, I get, yeah. you know, but you can do your best. But, and then when you get that information, you know, what kind of diet to put them on to, to prevent it. Like there's a couple different diets to put them on to prevent the stone formation. Okay. So there's three different types of stones you said? Yeah, there's like three or four. Uh, the urate stones are more with uh, certain breeds and cysteine stones are like really common with like Dalmatians. Uh, the most common stones for a urinary, like a bladder um, is calcium oxalate or struvite. Um, the other ones tend to come with other metabolic issues that okay. not every dog deals with. Yeah. So the most common ones are those uh, based on the the diet that the dog's on, or are they hereditary, or is it a combination of both? Combination of both, um, but a lot of it does have to do with the diet. Uh, certain diets may cause different those different pH levels in the urine, um, and that dog might be a little bit more hereditary to be predisposed to making bladder stones. Um, but it's not like a straight shot thing with hereditary. Like it is like some breeds of dogs get certain types of cancers. It's not quite directly like that, but you know, uh, we can, we can see certain breeds getting it more than others for sure. Um, I would say most commonly we see it a lot in our smaller breed dogs, but we, we see them in, in our large breed dogs as well. So I don't know. It's kind of interesting, but a lot of it has to do with the diet and then the, the health of the urinary tract of that dog. Okay. And you kind of jumped into my next question. What breeds are most predisposed to getting bladder stones? Or even if there's not like a set, like, you know, three breeds that come to mind, are there a certain, are there certain breeds that most frequently come to you that seem to have these, even if they're not necessarily predisposed? predisposed to. Yeah. Yeah. I get what you're saying. I, you know, I wouldn't say that there's one completely off the top of, off of the top of my head that has one more than another. I've had just about, I feel like every breed come in with it. Um, but I, I think sometimes we may see it more in our smaller dogs because it might be situational as in sometimes with smaller dogs, people, tend to hold them more, do more things with them, you know, or like go outside with them, that kind of thing. Not saying that we don't with our larger dogs, but there's a lot of dogs that they just live, they like are outside or they do their own thing, they're in and out. And so I think sometimes um, it could be like a little skewed that way, but I've seen it in just about every breed for sure. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we were kind of talking about diet and urinary tract health are there ways to prevent them? And I know it can't be an end all be all. This will prevent all bladder stones, but just any like advice for trying to prevent them in general? Like, I don't know if there's particular things in food that usually cause them or maybe certain supplements, um, but just anything you can think of to prevent bladder stones. Yeah. And there are some like over the counter diets that are for urinary tract health. And it doesn't necessarily have the ingredients in there to dissolve a stone, or if you know a dog's already had a stone to put them on that prescription diet. But I know there's cat food um, and dog food that have urinary health benefits to them. So maybe they have like a probiotic in them. Um, maybe, you know, also encouraging them to drink more water or sometimes adding water to their food, uh, even if it's dry food, just so that they can get more water intake and flush out more. Also let people know, which I'm guilty of this as well, but if they're holding their bladder for longer periods of time, just like us, they can be predisposed to UTIs or having issues. And so 
if your dog it might be predisposed to having that, then trying to get them to go outside more frequently. But um, I'm definitely guilty of that because there's some days I'm at the hospital for like 14 hours and, you know, right. my dog's a champ and I don't know how he holds it that long, but he does. And so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like my bladder would be bursting. I don't understand, yeah. but um but there are some diets for that. But usually, to be completely honest, usually we don't start them on something until there's an issue. Because uh, some dogs make, a lot of dogs will never have an issue. Like they'll never form one. Right. Um, and so it's not until we know it's there that we really put them on a diet or change, you know, what you do day to day until there, you know, there's a possible issue. Okay. So if someone thinks their dog might have a UTI or a bladder stone, I mean, ordinarily, let's say my dog goes out and they're posturing and they're not, they're not going to the bathroom. Would you give it a few more tries? And then uh, what does that look like for a a pet owner? Cause kind of like earlier when I was like, when, when should we come to the ER? Similarly for this issue, it's like, well, okay, I don't really know if they have anything going on with their bladder or their urinary tract, but you know, when is the telltale sign to like, okay, we need to go somewhere and we probably need to get it done soon. Right. I would say if it's one thing, like if you wake up in the morning, well, so I kind of let people know when you wake up in the morning, the first thing you have to do usually is go to the bathroom. And it's very same, very similar with our pets. If they went the bathroom before going to bed and then you wake up and you try to take your pet outside to go to the bathroom and they're trying to go, but they can't, I would try to get them in to get them seen. Or if you see some coming out or they pee and then they walk a couple more steps, you know, you take them on a walk and then they pee some more and then they squat some more because maybe they have that burning sensation. Then if the urine's coming out of the animal, then you might be able to wait a day or something to get in to see your primary care for a possible UTI. If no urine is coming out of the animal and you know they've been drinking water or it's the first thing in the morning, um, then I always recommend safe and sorry, just bring them into your primary care or to an ER and we can feel for you or put an ultrasound probe on there for you and catch something before it's bad. So if urine is coming out, then that's great. So that means, you know, the the pipes are clear, but if there's little dribbles coming out or they're constantly posturing or they haven't gone to the bathroom in like 12 to 24 hours, like we should really, you know, get them in to get them seen. Okay. And is there anything that might manifest like a bladder stone or a UTI, but it could actually be something totally different? Ah, yeah. Um, and I would say vice versa too, you know, like some people, like they, they come in and their dog's vomiting. They think it got into the trash or something. And, you know, um, we end up deciding to do an x-ray and we're like, huh. so it actually might be that this is going on, you know, like, but it's the same thing. Um, they could be, they, you could think that they have a UTI or a bladder stone, but maybe they actually have like a bladder mass, or maybe they have prostatitis if they're a male dog and that prostatitis can cause inflammation and them not be able to pee, very similar to humans that have big prostates. Um, Sometimes it's that their kidneys are really angry. Like maybe they, um, you know, got into a toxin that affects their kidneys, or maybe they are actually having some like a, they've had chronic kidney disease, but we're just now figuring it out. So a lot of it is we kind of do that whole package, you know? So they come in and we're like, Hey, it could be, you know, if it, if they're urinating frequently, or let's say they're drinking a lot, peeing a lot, that could actually be a metabolic disorder. So let's do some blood work and maybe a urinalysis and then go from there, maybe take some x-rays. So yeah, there's a lot of things that can look like each other and really just doing those diagnostics or that good physical exam and uh, getting those vitals and feeling on their belly can just help so much in determining which way, because but yeah, they, there's things in there that are like great pretenders. Like you think it's one thing, but it's really something else. And right. you always have to have that in the back of your brain, you know? So that's where those diagnostics help so much, especially in times of them being ill or emergencies. So one curveball I have for you, and it's kind of on the opposite side of not going to the bathroom. Ah. So this has actually come up this week with one of my dogs and he is Ooh. going to the bathroom so much. And I'm talking, he's peeing literal puddles all day. 
but his water intake hasn't changed. And so um, I actually asked a few other people about this and they're like, oh, I really don't know because the first thing that comes to mind when a dog is urinating a lot is diabetes. And diabetes, it can't be the only thing, you know what I mean? But for most people, we're all like, it's either diabetes or we don't know. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so on the opposite side of not peeing, um, what would you, what normally happens if you see a dog who's urinating a ton? What does that, what could that be? And what kind of tests would you recommend for that? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a lot, there are uh, three, I guess I should say, yeah, three big things that I think of when a dog's urinating a lot or calling called polyuria. And that is diabetes, like you said, Mm -hmm. two is a, is a metabolic disorder, whether it's something called Cushing's disease, Cushing's disease is uh, when your body makes too much cortisol and makes them tend to just droop, like go through, um, fluids like crazy. Um, and then the third one also would be when they have too little cortisol. So it's called Addison. So it's the opposite of, um, Cushing's disease. And then I guess the fourth one would be kidney disease. So they might not be in like kidney failure, you know, they might not be in kidney failure, but they could be in a certain stage of kidney disease. So if you came in and told me that my questions would be, are they still eating for you? And also any kind of vomiting, any type of, and then increased thirst. Like, is there any increased thirst and um, are they voiding large volumes of urine? If it's smaller volumes, it could still be a UTI symptom because they're peeing when they should, you know, like in the house, wherever the case mm-hmm. may be. Um, but if you are like, they're still eating a lot, like they're eating mm-hmm. a lot and they're doing okay. And I'm like, mm, okay, I'm still a little bit worried about diabetes because they tend to still have an appetite and same with Cushing's disease. Addison's, they tend to be kind of the opposite. They're vomiting. They're not really wanting to eat. Can't keep weight on that kind of situation. And then kidney disease until the kidneys are almost completely their functions gone, they act normal. So they might be a little bit dehydrated, Mm -hmm. but they're still hungry, have their appetite. But then once the kidney, you know, 70% that function's gone is when they start, you start seeing that I don't want to eat, you know, I'm still really, really thirsty, but I can't seem to get enough water. So I would do blood work and I would do a urinalysis. So to rule in and out any, you know, those are, that's like our baseline diagnostics, rule out any kind of infection, any kind of acute kidney injury or chronic kidney injury. And then also the urinalysis tells me how concentrated is the urine. So if they're drinking a lot and peeing a lot, and it's really unconcentrated, then I'm worried about the kidney function. If Mm -hmm. it's still really concentrated, then I'm worried about a different metabolic issue. So it really kind of, you know, you sit there and like in your mind, I feel like you're one of those memes with like the woman who has like all the math around her. (laughs) Right. (laughs) That's kind of what you do. And so anytime, you know, the doctor or the technician's like probing you with questions, it's because I'm like going through like a Venn diagram, like just going through a diagram in my brain and figuring out what's best for this dog right now. So Mm -hmm. I would recommend just doing like a full, like a full workup and see, you know, what do we have going on and, um, and see if you can get on top of it or if it's something simple, great, you know, just to set those expectations. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that's really good advice. Um, so is there any more just, and this could be very general, do you have any advice for dog owners for anything? It could be anything just related to your emergency practice that maybe, maybe you see it so frequently. You're like, I wish people knew X, Y, Z. Is there anything you can think of? I would say that the main thing that I probably run into, which I'm, I'm very blessed that with veterinary emergency group, with the owners being there, we get a sense of trust. So instead of, cause you know, you have a, you have a relationship with your primary care. So you have trust with them, but then when your dog is in an emergency situation and you're going to someone you've met for the first time and you know, it's like, ha, ah, like everything's like heightened into 10. Um, I'm blessed to be able to have the owners there. So we build that trust that day. I would say the main thing is I know emergency can be expensive. Like I know, I know that. And it, 
is sometimes really tough on us too. But if a veterinarian is recommending certain diagnostics, it's really because they're trying to rule out life-threatening or really scary things. Right. And so, and, and that's the same with primary care too, but like with emergency, uh, you know, some people will be like, oh, you're just, you know, wanting my money. I don't need to do it. And I'm like, no, it's because I want to make sure that before you go home, your pet's okay. And so I want to do these things. And I would say, if you have any type of concern for your pet, don't feel silly bringing them in. There's some people who are like, I feel really dumb. I, I shouldn't have brought my dog. I'm like, don't ever feel dumb about loving your pet. You should bring them in in times of need. And we're here for you in those times of need. And so even like I said, if you bring them in and you just do an exam and you figure out everything's just fine, well, then guess what? You're going to sleep well that night. And right. so I would say the mo- that would be probably the most common thing is just, you know, best not to wait, just go get them checked out. And if it's something that can wait for further diagnostics with your primary care, if maybe you're cost concerned or, you know, you've realized they're going to be okay, but you still want a more workup. Awesome. Like, great. That's like the best case scenario for us, you know? So um, I would say that that would be the common like day-to-day emotional or mental strife that we can have sometimes as ER veterinarians. Um, But in regards to like getting into things, I would say... Uh, you know, super common for dogs to be getting into like trash or eating socks or Mm -hmm. eating things they shouldn't. Uh, One of my favorite things to do as an ER doctor, and this sounds kind of cruel when I think about it, is is make them throw up. So when they come in and they're like, (laughs) they just ate this, you know, their toy, or they just ate a sock, like, or they ate something out of the hamper, whatever the case may be. I'm like, how long ago? And they're like, 20 minutes ago. I'm like, bring them in. You know, and they're like, should I do like the peroxide? And I'm like, no, like I'm peroxide can work in a pinch, but it can also cause aspiration, like pneumonia. If they're like, to oh, vomit. that's good but, to know. Yeah. So I, I prefer that if you think your pet ate something, take them to an EC so we can give them a medication. It goes IV and they vomit within two, three minutes. Oh, wow. And it's so yeah. And I feel bad for them when they do it because they're like, they look like, you know, one of the, someone's had a really tough night and they're like hanging over the toilet, like <laughs> their mouth are drooling, like yeah. struggling, but then you get up that sock and sometimes another one comes up too. And the owner's like, I had no idea. And you're like, victory. You do like a dance, you know, to have, you know, you never think you'd be so excited to see your dog grow up, but you just avoided an endoscopy or you just avoided a major surgery. And so I feel I, that's like one of my favorite things. Like when they come in is I'm like, let's make them vomit, you know, let's see what they got in there. You know, let's avoid, you know, thousands of dollars. And, you know, your dog gets a little bit of a lesson for a second because he regrets some of his decisions. But um, yeah, I would say that's really common. That's especially around like the holidays when they oh, yeah. fed, you know, or they got into the candy or they got into whatever. Um, we see a lot of upset tummies and dogs that ate things that they shouldn't have during the holidays. <laughs> How quickly. Okay. So you have an IV that can make them throw up in two to three minutes. So what proximity of time do you need to see them in? So if they ate something three hours ago, can you still make it happen or is it too late? Mm -hmm. Depending on what they think it is. If it's something that is uh, mostly food, might be kind of hard. I'm kind of the person that I would just rather make them vomit. Like, let's just, if anything, nothing will come up, right? So Mm -hmm. if you think that they ate something toxic, that's not corrosive, right? Just like us. Like if we had something corrosive, we don't want it to come back up. But Mm -hmm. if it's something that we think we can still get out or it was, you know, I've had dogs that had a sock in their stomach for like two days because they were like, huh, the dog has been fine for a day, but now today it's vomiting. That's weird. Mm -hmm. You know, and they bring them in and we find a sock or whatever the case may be. So it depends on what it is that they ate. Uh, If it's food or um, I would say something that anything that's like really, really small that can get like through that, the sphincters of the stomach quickly, uh-huh. it can be hard, but I pretty much always err on the side of caution. And I just make them vomit, especially if they were like, my dog ate all this chocolate, you know, a couple hours ago, I'm like, just bring them in. Like, let's just yeah. see what we can get out and just try to do that decontamination. Um, but usually we say if it's been more than four or five hours and it's not like a substance like you know like soft Mm -hmm. toy 
something like that, then we just let them know, like, we might not be fruitful, but it's worth it. And right. so um, we just kind of give them that, you know, let them know the prognosis of that. But I've had some though, they ate chocolate the night before I still made them vomit and they still had a <laughs> bunch of chocolate that was just digesting in there. And I was like, and that's the rest of it that we don't have to worry about. So let's, <laughs> you know, get that out of there. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I would say that's, that's probably most common. And then my last thing in regards to cats, cats actually get urinary blockage very frequently. Male cats do. I've actually heard that. And I've actually known quite a few people who have had that issue come up. Yeah. And that is equally as life threatening. It doesn't matter if it's a dog or a cat. The main thing you'll notice with your cat is that they'll keep going to the litter box and they tend to vocalize when they're going to the bathroom, like they're painful. So if they're crying out, going back and forth to the bathroom, not wanting to eat, just like very um, uncomfortable, very anxious, then bring them in, especially if it's a male cat, uh, because more than likely they probably have a urinary blockage and they need some help unblocking. And um, most of the time they actually get that like sandy, gritty stuff. So usually mm-hmm. we have to regardless put in a urinary catheter and flush their bladder for a couple of days to get all that out of there. Um, so um, that is definitely probably another one of the top things that we see. We probably have a couple unblocked cats a week or, you know, that we, um, help them with. So that's the other thing. So dogs get blocked, cats get blocked. Like just kind of got a humans get blocked. (laughs) Humans get blocked. Everyone gets blocked. (laughs) The main difference I would say with humans is that, you know, I mean, dogs can get a lot of kidney stones too. Mm -hmm. Not as common for them to like migrate, you know, um, a lot of times they kind of stay where they are, whereas humans will pass a kidney stone. And that's Mm -hmm. kind of interesting to me that they don't, and like dogs, they don't really necessarily move from the kidney down to the bladder. They usually just form in the bladder. And when oh, okay. you find, yeah, when you find kidney stones or, or renaliths is what they, what they call them. A lot of times it's incidental. Um, but I have, I mean, when I remember when I was in school, they did have an animal in there that tried to uh, like a renolith tried to pass and then it like ruptured the ureter or something like that, like something crazy. That is so uncommon. I've never seen one since I've been out super uncommon, but that's very similar to what a dog who ruptured their bladder looks like. They don't feel well. They Mm -hmm. have an upset stomach. It's the same thing. We just have to kind of do more investigating as to what it, what happened. So, right. um, But yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for all of this. I'm sure that anyone that listens will get a ton of information. They'll be able Mm -hmm. to know what to look for because I told a few people what today's episode was, um, that we were Mm -hmm. recording and they were like, dogs get bladder stones. And I'm like, yeah, they do. Mm -hmm. And they're like, Mm -hmm. are you sure? I'm like, I'm totally sure. You're like, I I think so. I'm having a whole podcast on it. So I really hope (laughs) it is true. (laughs) Right. So I think that this is going to be very, very Mm -hmm. informative and I really appreciate your time today. Absolutely happy to be here. And like you said, a lot of times we uh, take them into the x-ray room after we take those x-rays and we point at those stones and we're like, there's stones in there. And they're like, what are you talking about? I didn't know this Mm -hmm. could happen. And you're like, yeah, unfortunately it is happening, but we'll figure out a way to help, you know? So, um, but no, happy to help anytime. If anyone, you know, needs an emergency situation and they can't seem to get a hold of anybody, just look up veterinary emergency group online and you might be able to see one that's actually closest to you. Like we're building so many each year. Um, And not only that, you can speak to a doctor, whether you're going to take them there or not. And a lot of times that's just all you need. So we're, we're always happy to help. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for tuning into the canine culture podcast. Please make sure you subscribe to the canine culture podcast on your favorite podcast platform and make sure you're following us on social media. If you have any recommendations, any topics that you'd like to hear, if you know of any guests that would be good for the show, or if you yourself want to be a guest, please reach out to us, send us an email at canineculturepodcast at gmail.com or send us a direct message on social media. Thank you for listening and please share this with any of your dog loving friends.